All right, y'all. I do believe I'm live on Facebook. So let me give everybody a few minutes to come on. We're going to start right on time at 2.30. Because I believe in starting on time. Hmm. So, yeah, it's been a long week, been a busy week, but been a productive week. And that's what counts if you get to move the needle any closer to your goals. You don't want to let time pass and you're no closer to your goals. So you want to be sure you're at least moving the needle week by week, at least have some type of measurable progress for what you're doing. Because if you don't have measurable progress, you end up getting really frustrated. <laughs> so you want to be sure that you are moving forward. All right. Hello to my sister. All right. So remember, it's how you handle all the days in the middle. I know everybody wants the big day, uh, the graduation day, the breakthrough day, the whatever, and that is today, yes. Uh, by faith until faith becomes sight. But in the meantime, you got to be faithful on the days in the middle and keep doing the things you need to do. Keep doing the things you need to do to get to where you want to go. Because what other way is there? <laughs> Ooh, all right, gonna give people another minute. We're gonna start right at you up. 2.30 now, so here we go. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you, Lord, for being able to come before your presence, O oh God, and give you the sacrifice of praise. We bless your name. We kiss your lips, O oh God. We love you and magnify you. As you got right now, and fill me with the Holy Ghost. Wash me clean, Lord. I must decrease so you can increase, O oh God. So I surrender myself to you right now, O oh God. Use me to breathe. Through me, oh God, and whatever words are spoken are the words that you want spoken. And let uh, your power and your voice and your purpose, let your will be done, oh God, in all of the myriad of levels and ways and the far reaching impact, oh God, which is something only you can understand. But we're excited about it. We believe signs and wonders and miracles are going to follow this prophetic word. And we're looking for you to do great things because we know that you and your word never fails. We thank you for it. We believe you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. <clears throat> Today's live prophetic word is leap year. Today's live prophetic word is leap year. Now, I know you think that sounds crazy. Don't worry. Don't worry. I am going to hook it up for you. Okay. What would you do if your arm had been in a sling since you were a baby? Let's say you had an arm in a sling and you were born with two arms and two hands. You had all your limbs and everything, but you had some kind of accident or some type of malady. And ever since you were a child, that left arm has been in a sling and you've been carrying it around like that and you've done everything with one hand with your right hand. What would you do if the day came where somebody told you you could use that arm, you could use that hand and you could use it right now with no more delay? What would you do if you were 25, 30, 35, 38, 40 years old and you had never used that left arm and all of a sudden an opportunity came for you to use that left arm. <clears throat> Would you take it? 
Would you believe it? Let's say somebody told you they were going to fund your dreams. And no matter what the cost, no matter what it was you wanted to do, whether it was build a business, go back to school, have a big wedding, uh, what you know, buy some property, buy a dog, whatever, whatever your dream was, uh, become an author. What if somebody came along and told you that they were going to fund your dream and they gave you a blank check, no questions asked, that you could go from today, maybe not living what you wanted, to tomorrow, having everything you wanted funded and living in that dream. Would you take it? Would you believe it? Would you believe it? That's the thing. What if you wanted to find a relationship and somebody told you tomorrow that we're going to lead you straight to the person that was meant for you and the person that you were for? And after all this time, you waited and uh, prayed and fasted, whatever. And in a moment of time, Somebody told you, oh, well, yeah, no, I got this perfect person for you. Yeah, no, you need to meet this person. Would you believe it? Would you go? What would you do if you had an opportunity, an opportunity of a lifetime, but it was a sudden opportunity and you went from zero to a hundred in a blink? Would you take that? Would you believe that? Would you receive that? Today's prophetic word is about leap year. Now, I know when I get words like this, they may not be for everybody, but I also know that those that have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying, they're going to catch it. Because sometimes when you study miracles in the Bible and when you study the life of Jesus and when you study great miracle workers in the Bible, like Bible, like Elijah and Elisha, I want you to notice that a lot of the, the background and the environment and the circumstances of a miracle were quite unorthodox and were quite not the way you think it would go, but which amazes me that people think that way because the only way you can have a great miracle is if you have a great need. The only way you can have a great miracle is if there's great opposition. The only way you can have a great miracle is if there's great resistance, okay? But if you study many of the miracles in the Bible, particularly in the life of Christ, Elijah, and Elisha, you will see that the circumstances, just like last week we talked about Hannah, you will see that the circumstances were often quite bizarre or maybe unexpected. Like one woman came to the prophet and said, I want a baby, but my husband is old. And, you know, so we don't think it's going to happen. And uh, it was either Elijah or Elisha told her this time next year, you're going to have a child. Twelve years later, that same child died. I think it was Elisha. And that same woman came and said to him, I told you not to play games with me. Why would God give me a son only to take him away? And Elisha took that son into the upper room and walked around him and breathed on him and spoke the words to him. Then he ended up laying on him and pressing his face on him, breathing right into his mouth. And the child sneezed seven times and sat up. One of the Lord's miracles was literally interrupting a funeral. And he called the girl up off the deathbed or the death march at a coffin, whatever she was in. The woman with the issue of blood. The Lord was not facing her. He was on his way somewhere else and she grabbed him from behind and literally pulled the virtue out of him when Naaman the leper got healed, okay? He had a, a, a patch of leprosy. His leprosy didn't call, cover his whole body, but he had a visible patch of leprosy. It was like the only weakness he had in his life because he was a mighty war, warrior and a mighty military man, and he had a very good reputation, but he had that open patch of leprosy, something he was very ashamed about, okay? And he wanted Elisha to heal him, he thought Elisha was going to do something big and dramatic, and that's what he was expecting. And Elisha didn't even come out the tent to meet him face to face. Elisha sent word. <laughs> Elisha sent word by his servant and said, "Go wash in the Jordan River seven times." 
And Naaman was so angry, he started to turn around and go home. That's why I asked you at the top, would you take it if your miracle came like that? Would you take it? Because Naaman said, I thought he was going to come out and do some dramatic and wave his hand over the leprosy spot. And, and but you know, that's not what happened. And why should I dip myself in the Jordan River? And Naaman was going on and on. He was going to go back home, still cursed with that leprosy. And his servant said, Well, you know, if he said dip in the Jordan River, what do you have to lose? Just because it didn't happen the way you thought it was going to happen, just because Elisha didn't do something big and dramatic. Because I know Naaman felt belittled. I know he felt someone dissed because he was an important person, but Elisha didn't think he was important enough to, <laughs> to come out to 10 and meet him face to face. And I know Naaman wasn't used to being treated that way. And he almost missed his miracle because it didn't happen like he thought. So what would you do if a miracle walked right up to you, but maybe it wasn't wearing the clothes you thought it would wear. Maybe it didn't sound like what you thought it would sound like, or maybe what you had to do. I like some of these people, like again, the woman with the issue of blood got desperate because she was out of options. So what's that got to do with today's prophetic word? Today's prophetic word is leap year. Now I know the official calendar leap year isn't again until 2024 when we add the extra day in February and we won't have February 29th until 2024. I know that, but that's the natural calendar. That's the calendar that we use in the spiritual calendar. For some people that can grab this word, because if you don't understand how prophetic words work, when the spirit of God gives something to the mouth of the prophet and they release it, it's up to you to catch it by faith. I know that so many of us have been conditioned to believe in manna. I know so many of us have been conditioned to believe that it's all up to God and nothing's up to you, but that's not what the scripture teaches. The scripture teaches that according to your faith, so it is unto you. The scripture teaches that you have to add your faith to the word that you hear, which is why hearing the word of God for a lot of people doesn't do them any good. You know why? Because they nod and they say yes and they say amen, but they don't actually believe it and nothing in their life changes. But for somebody out there that's hearing this word, and for me too, what the Holy Ghost is saying is that you got to leap into your miracle. <laughs> I'm sorry, I keep laughing. I keep laughing because, because it's time to do something drastic. You've got to leap into your miracle. You got to leap into your miracle. Uh, Katie Holmes, actress Katie Holmes, she was in high school and she sent in an audition tape for Dawson's Creek and they liked her so much, they said, You got the job. Then you know what she said? She said, I'm not leaving Ohio prematurely. I'm not leaving before I graduate because I'm in a play with my classmates and I'm not going to leave them high and dry. And you know what they said? They wanted her for Joey Potter so badly. They say, we'll postpone production until you can get here. Wow. Wow. So she went from a girl in high school to on a nationally televised TV show in less than a year, uh, overnight when they started filming, okay? What if something like that happened to you? Could you walk into it? Do you have enough faith to catch an opportunity like that if God were to bring it by you, if life were to offer you that up? So let's look at some stuff in the Bible and you get a better idea of what I'm talking about. We're going to look at a very familiar scripture to start with. We're going to look at Acts chapter three. I actually need to read. Okay. Need to read that. Uh, I'll read Acts chapter three, verses one through 10. Very familiar if you know this story. I'm reading out of the New International Version. 
One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. Now, a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold, I do not have, but what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. And then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Now, when you look at verse eight out of the Berean Study Bible, Acts 3, 8, he said, he sprang to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and leaping. Okay, that word there out of the Greek means to leap, leap up of water, to spring up or bubble up. Walking and leaping and praising God. So he wasn't just leaping, he was bubbly leaping. He was bubbly. All right. This man had been lame from birth. And what that means is that he came out of his mother's womb, lame or crippled or maligned in some way. To where he couldn't walk. That means he's never walked. If he was lame from birth, that means he did not have one day out of his life where he walked. And then he asked for money and people have done violence to verse six when Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, trying to intimate that somehow they were broke or they didn't have any money, which cannot possibly be true. Especially after Jesus blessed Peter with a net breaking load of fish not too long ago. So what he meant was the silver and the gold wouldn't solve his problem. He said, but what I do have, I give you, I have a name that will solve your problem. But then Peter took him by the right hand and helped him up. And instantly the man's feet and ankle bones became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. Now, <laughs> this man went from zero to 100 in a moment of time. Let me say that one more time. He went from zero, from never walking, to leaping and jumping and walking. You would think he would just keep it at the walking level since this was the first time, but he didn't just walk. He jumped to his feet, began to walk, and then he started walking and jumping and leaping. So the Holy Ghost wanted me to say, there are some people, if you can catch this word by faith, where it's time for you to do something drastic and leap up. Sometimes people get on the slow climb. Sometimes people get on the slow burn. What would you do if it was time for you to get on the fast track? What would you do if all of a sudden it was time for you to go from having never had something to walking around in it, jumping, leaping like, like you'd always had it. How did he even know how to walk? He'd never done it before. Remember that when we're babies, we stumble around for a while trying to find our legs and we crack our heads on the floor and we crack our heads on the tables and we do a whole bunch of stuff. And we stumble around, we pull ourselves up slowly, slowly getting that balance, getting that strength in those thighs and those knees and those ankles. But this man never did that. He never had that time as a baby where he learned how to walk and where he pulled himself up. He never did anything like that. And he went from never having walked to jumping up, walking, jumping, and leaping. So the Holy Ghost is using this as an example of how you can go from zero to 100 like that. 
You say, if that's possible, Prophet Taylor, why don't more people do that? I'll tell you why. Because it takes faith and you have to take a chance. See, what people are really, really desirous of in a very intense kind of way is what I call safe miracles. People want safe miracles, and sometimes that's a bit of an oxymoron. People want miracles where there's no chance, there's no risk, no risk involved. And there's nobody in the scriptures that got a miracle that got one with no risk whatsoever. Not one person. Not one person, King David, on his way to the palace, when he was still a shepherd boy, killed a lion and a bear with his bare hands. God used that experience to build his face so he could face Goliath. And then when he killed Goliath, he got to marry the king's daughter and got to be tax-free and got a lot of benefits because he helped deliver Israel. So he didn't just go from God saying, I found a man after my own heart to sitting on the throne. He had to leap through some stuff, okay? He had to leap through some serious stuff. And what if, what if you got a chance to go from zero to 100? What have you been or you thought you've been on a slow burn and God is saying slow burn is over? Okay. Uh, uh, I cooked some stir fry last night and it was really, really good. Some of the stuff I had to put the vegetables because some of the vegetables, I put them straight in there frozen and you use low heat when you're doing that to let stuff melt, but that it doesn't get crispy too fast. But then at some point when everything's melted together, you have to turn up the heat. That's what they do when they have a walk in a restaurant. If you notice, that food tends to sizzle when they're cooking your stir fry. So I had to turn it up, I had to turn the heat up and had to get it to sizzle with all the stuff I put in it. What if you've been on a slow burn for a while and now God is saying, now it's time to turn the heat up and the food will be ready in minutes. What if your miracle is ready in minutes? What if you've been waiting for years and the answer comes in minutes? Could you do it? Do you believe it? Would you take it if you had a chance? Because remember, Peter and John told that man to look at them. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. What if that man had been like, uh, well, you know, y'all don't look like y'all got no money. So, so you know, I'm out. Deuces. <laughs> then he wouldn't have got a miracle. Okay. Peter told him to look at us. Then he said, in the name of the Lord, and then Peter helped pull him up. And then, okay, I want you to notice that Peter didn't pray. Peter didn't say, oh, Lord in heaven, hear me, if it be thy holy will. I can't tell you the number of times I heard people pray that over you. If it be, that's not what Peter did. Peter didn't pray at all because he knew it was the will of God for the sick to be healed and the lame to walk and the paralytics to get off of their bed and for the demon possessed and oppressed to be set free. Do you know how Peter knew that? Peter knew that because he watched Jesus do it so much. And Jesus was the will of God, the will of the Father in action. Jesus was the Bible made flesh. Peter watched Jesus do that on the regular. So he didn't have to pray and ask God if it be thy will. Do you have that kind of faith? Do you have that kind of confidence in your life changing? Because, you know, some people stay in a state of expectancy so long, all they expect is to be more expectant. <laughs> That's like being 47 weeks pregnant. <laughs> if you're 47 weeks pregnant, something may get you know, gone a little wrong along the way because at some point, you're supposed to have a baby. You ain't supposed to be 24 months pregnant. At some point, you got to have the baby. Okay? And, and some people just keep expecting to expect. Okay? So uh, they say 40 weeks. 
for regular pregnancy. If you're on your 47th week, you call in the doctor, you call in the OB guy, you call in Oprah, you call in Dr. Phil, you call in Ghostbusters, you call in everybody you know if you're 47 weeks pregnant. Okay? Because at some point, baby got to come out. So what if God is saying that you've been in a state of expectancy so long that all you expect is to expect some more? What if God is saying it's time to leap into that miracle? Let's look at another verse. Let's look at 2 Samuel 22. Now, this is uh, a song that David wrote when he got delivered from uh, Saul, but also after he'd killed Goliath. David was talking about all the physical things God allowed him to do. So in other words, David was saying that he understood that the only reason he had any type of victory or success or prowess on the battlefield is because the spirit of God was boosting his natural ability. Let me say that one more time. It's not the first time that's happened either because that happened with Samson as well. David was saying he understood that his ability to fight and kill giants and kill lions and bears and all the different things he was doing on the battlefield was not just due to his youth or his physical prowess. He knew that because the Holy Ghost was with him and upon him, that the Spirit of God was boosting his natural ability to do things. So King David says in 2 Samuel 22, 30, for in you, meaning in God, for in you I can charge an army. With my God, I can scale a wall. That's the Berean Study Bible. King James Bible says, for by thee I have run through a troop. By my God have I leaped over a wall. English Standard Version, for by you I can run against a troop. And by my God, I can leap over a wall. I told you that sometimes you gonna look crazy. David said, I ran at a troop by myself. How could he cut his way or run his way or anything his way through a troop? He did that supernaturally. And then he said, I can leap over a wall. I can leap, he said, by my God, have I leaped over a wall is what the King James says. So in other words, David was like doing some stuff out there, some Spider-Man stuff, some bionic stuff, some enhanced strength and agility stuff, okay? So you have to know that on the run up, on the come up, that would have to look crazy. They out there on the battlefield and here comes a whole troop of enemies and David go charging out by himself, ah! All with the sword and the slingshot there. And everybody like, because that would have to look crazy. If there's a wall and it's a wall that's higher than people can leap over and David just went charging at it full blast. Now I see most people going to get the smack, get right here with the smack and your nose is coming out two dimensional because you just ran into a wall at 40 miles an hour. That's not what happened. David says somehow his feet left the ground and he leaped over the wall, but he said, I did it by God. So do you have the faith to do something like that? That just in the natural, just look crazy, but it gets you to where you're trying to go. It gets you to victory that you've been talking about all this time. Or do you want to be pregnant for 47 more weeks? Okay, I'm just asking the question because now you're 94 weeks pregnant. You ain't supposed to be pregnant for no 94 weeks. Let's look at another verse. We're going to look at Isaiah now. Okay, now the thing about dealing with Isaiah is Isaiah is one of the major prophets of the Old Testament. And I tell you all the time, major and minor, those descriptive terms just mean Major prophets had longer books, 30 and 40 and 50 and 60 plus chapters. And minor prophets tend to have books that weren't any more than four to five at best. So when you're talking about a minor prophet, it just means their books were smaller, not their messages were less important. 
And when you're talking about a major prophet, they had a very, very long prophetic book. Isaiah is one of the major prophets. His book clocks in at, at least 66 chapters, a few more, I think, but at least 66. So what Isaiah is talking about here, Isaiah is straddling lanes of time in his prophecy. So I would have to go deep into it, but Isaiah is talking about the present time when he released his prophecy. He was talking about the future time for the restoration of Israel, but he was also talking about the end time at the end of the world, at the end of the book of Revelation, where the Lord ends this age. So a lot of Isaiah's prophecies are multi-time-based. They're, they're, they're multi-chronometric. He's talking about more than one event in the same prophecy. And I know that always trips people out, but God is like that because God is outside of time. So whenever God is talking about something that looks like a future event to us, future event to us God is actually already in it. God has actually lived all the days, if you, don't, if you don't understand what I mean. So every day until he ends this age, he's actually already lived it. So the Lord already knows what's going to happen in 2022 because he's walked through every day in 2022. And if you talk to God right now, he's looking right at it. He's already lived it. So thing past, present, and future is relative to us, not God. I know that can be confusing sometimes. So when Isaiah is talking here in this particular prophecy, he's talking about the restoration of Israel, which did happen when they got delivered from the Assyrians, but he's also talking about the future restoration of Zion. And he's talking about the ultimate restoration of God's people, okay? Uh, because a lot of what Isaiah says sounds like it's pointing to the millennial reign of Christ. And that's a whole nother subject that everybody argues about whether Jesus is actually going to live on earth for a thousand years, going to come back down and all that. But I'm not going to talk about that right now. But I am saying that when you read Isaiah, you have to keep all that in mind, that he's straddling lanes of time with his prophetics, which is entirely possible because God is eternal. He's outside of time. So how could God not know everything? He's already lived those days. Okay. So with that in mind, Isaiah 35, let's read five, six, and seven. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer and the mute tongue will shout for joy for waters will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The parched ground will become a pool. The thirsty land springs of water. In the haunt where jackals once lay, there will be grass and reeds and papyrus. Okay, now I have to take you to another level. You've heard me mention it before, but I'm going to go a little bit deeper into it now. Some people will get this. Some people won't. The word of God is not just the Bible printed on the page. The word of God is actually spirit and life. It's actually alive. And what that means is that you can take your faith and use God's word to create things. You can pull things from the invisible to the visible by saying what God says, because when God has said something, it's actually real and it exists in the spirit realm. When God said, let there be light, he called light from the invisible to the visible. And everything that God said, let this happen, he pulled it from the invisible to the visible. When the Lord did the miracle of the two fish and the five barley loaves, which he did twice, that's another thing that amazes me, okay? G that people don't get that. People are always talking about the miracle of 5,000. No, Jesus did that two times. He did it with 4,000 men, not counting women and children. But then he did it with 5,000 men, not counting women and children. So the Lord did a food multiplication miracle along that magnitude twice. It's not just the 5,000, it's the 4,000. How did the Lord take two fish and five barley loaves and, and multiply it enough to feed all the people? I'll tell you how. He pulled it from the invisible to the visible because that's how Father, Son, and Holy Ghost made everything. They used their faith to pull it 
from the invisible to the visible out here where we could see it. So because God's word is alive and because we're made in his image and we believe when you read something in the Bible, that's why I said this message is for those, is for those that can catch it. You can use your faith to pull a promise or, or something that the Bible says to pull it into your life because if God says it, it, it literally exists and it's alive in the spiritual, in the invisible realm. Because Jesus said, the words I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. So people that approach the scriptures and just think it's a literary work and they just see words on the page are missing the bigger dimension of what the scriptures actually are. It's actually a written representation of God's living word. I tell you all the time, the Bible is the written word and Jesus is the living word. Jesus is the Bible made into a person. Jesus is the Bible made flesh. Jesus is the Bible in action. So I'm saying that to say that if God makes a, uh, God gives Isaiah a prophetic word, he says, that the lame will leap like a deer and the mute tongue will shout for joy for waters will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. Hear me carefully. That doesn't just mean it's going to happen someday. That means like the woman with the issue of blood, you can pull that into your life now by faith. So if you have been lame, like the man we just read about in Acts 3, and you have never walked, Isaiah said that in that day, the day of the blessing of God, in the glory of Zion, the lame will leap like a deer. People that ain't never walked going to be leaping. You're going to be craning your head. Talking about, is that Sister Johnson? This is Johnson that ain't never walking. He's like, she up there jumping gonna be like that. But see, that's not just true in that day. It's true. It can be true in your life now if you believe it and pull it out of the invisible into the visible. Because that is where the Lord got the food from. He pulled it from the invisible to the visible. And that is how, hear me carefully, the woman with the issue of blood got her miracle because remember I told you very specifically, Peter told that lame man to look at us so the man could focus. If you read the woman with the issue of blood, you will discover that the woman with the issue of blood came up behind Jesus. Now, do not miss what I just said. She came up behind the Lord as he was walking somewhere else. That means the Lord wasn't even looking at her. And she reached up and grabbed that hem of his garment, pulled the virtue out of him, and felt her internal bleeding stop like that. Now, when you read the whole story, you will discover that when the Bible says, for she said, if I may but touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. The verb tense there suggests that she said it over and over again. In other words, she kept saying it. She kept saying, and there's a power of confession. Remember, I told you, you have to say it. She kept saying, if I may touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. If I may but touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. If I may but touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. So she's walking around the house talking to herself, releasing her faith because she's acting like God. She's saying what she wants to happen. When Father, Son, and Holy Ghost stood over the world during the creation week, Father didn't look over the balcony and say, that sure is a lot of darkness. That ain't what they said. They didn't say what they had. They said what they wanted. Jesus didn't turn the Holy Ghost and like, we're going to turn on the light around here? That ain't what happened. They said, let there be light. He said what he wanted and he pulled it from the invisible to the visible. That's why I'm trying to tell you to get them leaping miracles. It also says, says the mute tongue will shout for joy. If you've never talked, 
the string of your tongue can be unloosed in a moment of time. If you were born with an inability to talk, your mouth can open like that because it's not just for the future day. It's for, you can pull it into now. Where's another example of that in the Bible, Prophet Taylor? All right, I'm glad you asked. Another example of that in the Bible is Noah. The Bible says very, very clearly that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. God was so upset with humanity after Adam sinned, we became so corrupt so fast until God said, I've even looked into the hearts of the young people. I looked at the children and they're thinking evil continually. And God is like, I'm sorry, I made humans. What a thing for God to say. He said, I'm gonna wipe them all out. And he got ready to do that. But the Bible says that Noah found grace. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Do you understand what that means? What that means is that Noah prophetically understood that one day God was gonna justify people according to his goodness and not our goodness. And Noah knew how to talk to God and Noah basically knew, understood Titus 3, 5 before Titus 3, 5 was written. Titus 3 and 5 says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to your mercy, you saved us. So Noah knew how to say to God, not according to my righteousness, not according to works of righteousness, which I have done, because we don't have no righteousness before God, but according to your mercy, please save us. Noah was able to tap into the grace of God before the grace of God was officially released through Jesus. That's what that means. That Noah didn't try to stand on, his, even though the Bible said he was righteous and just and feared God and all that, that Noah didn't try to stand on his righteousness, but he knew how to ask God for grace before grace was officially given. That's what that means. And Noah saved the world because he knew how to pull grace out of God. He knew how to go before God and say, I'm not coming to you in my name and my righteousness. I'm not offering anything because I don't have any righteousness. I'm talking about your righteousness that you give freely through grace by faith. And he pulled that out of eternity before it was officially given on earth. Because remember that Noah existed before Moses. So we didn't even have the law. And Noah was able to pull grace, which is the foundational tenement of the New Testament written in Jesus' blood. Okay, well, we're many, many years away from Jesus in the days of Noah, but Noah was able to pull that blessing where God justifies us through his grace and not through any works that we try to do. Noah was able to get that in his life then and save the world with it. Just let that hit. I told you it was deep today. I told you we had to go to another level. So what I'm saying is, is that the Holy Ghost is challenging <clears throat> some of us out there to do like the woman with the issue of blood. Take a leap. If you think that it's not even, the, your miracle is not even looking at you, take a leap to do like King David said, that I'm not even fighting these fights in my own natural strength. I'm running up against a whole troop and I'm running through them, how? And I'm running up to a wall and somehow I'm springing over that wall, how? Supernaturally, that's how. They had to take a leap, okay? We're gonna read uh, at least this one more. We're gonna read Malachi. Malachi is not chronologically the last book in the Old Testament, but it is in the King James Version. It's not actually the last book written. And Malachi has a lot of contemporaries from people from other books. But uh, the way it's laid out in the King James Version, it's the last book in the Old Testament. So we're gonna look at Malachi chapter four, four verse two. Malachi is, is an example of what I meant before. Malachi is labeled as a minor prophet, but his book is powerful. You, oh my goodness. You will wonder, you will wonder about yourself if you read Malachi. Malachi is not a joke, okay? So 
we're going to, with all that I just said in mind, we're going to read two verses out of Malachi. We're going to read Malachi 4, 1, and 2. And as always, I want you to notice in the Bible, many times there's a juxtaposition with God of both judgment and favor, of both forgiveness and wrath, of both grace and reckoning. Many times in the Bible, those are sandwiched together. And I discovered that a lot of times people in church, they skip the wrath part. They skip the judgment part, which amazes me. Because you do realize that the Bible was not written in chapters and verses, right? So we're doing, we're doing it wrong when you don't read the whole thing. So you will see the contrast between verse 1 and verse 2. Malachi 4.1, for behold, the day is coming, burning like a furnace, when all the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble. The day is coming when I will set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts. Not a root or a branch will be left to them. Good God Almighty. Now, once again, just like Isaiah, that was literally true in the day he set, said it. But that also points to the end of the world because that language is what the Bible says in the book of Revelation when God ends this age. And so that's what I'm saying. It's multi-chronal. Okay, it's multi-time lanes. And the Lord said, the day is coming, burning like a furnace, when all the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble. The day is coming when I will set them up. As God said, all the arrogant and evil doing people, God said, I'm going to set them on fire and I'm going to burn them down to stubble, burn them down to nothing. Then he says, not a root or a branch will be left to them. See now, I got to go back to what I said before, before I read the next verse. When something comes out of God's mouth, it happens in the spirit as soon as God says it. I know, I know, I know that can hurt your brain. You have to get out of linear time. Just because you don't see something, that's why God tells us not to walk by sight. Just because you don't see something out here doesn't mean it's not real in the spiritual world. And anytime God says anything, as soon as he says it, it happens. It might take many days to unfold in time. That's from our point of view. But as soon as God says it, it happens. I know you have to get out of linear thinking. To understand that that's not a natural principle because you think life is two 12 hour cycles no that's the way we experience a day what life is is whatever god says whatever god says is what life is if god woke up tomorrow and said i want the sky green and the grass blue the sky returned green and the grass returned blue because life is whatever god says if you can grasp that if you can understand that that the only reason there's a sun in the sky is because god said so the only reason there's winter, spring, summer, and fall is because God says so. If you can grasp that, then you can understand that applies to everything God says. That's what I'm trying to get you to see. So if God says the day is coming, burning like a furnace, when all the arrogant and every evil doer, that means you don't have to worry about people that hate the Lord because he's already spoken a word that's already true in the invisible realm that he's going to show up burning like a furnace. And all the arrogant, all the people talking about they don't need Jesus and making fun of Jesus and making fun of Christians and they don't need God and all that. God has already pronounced their end. He said he's going to show up and that day going to burn like a furnace. And he said they're going to burn down the stubble. Okay. I've been in a house fire. I survived a house fire by the grace of God. I know what it's like to watch something burn from something to nothing because I've seen that. I know what that is. That's not a joke. Neither is the smoke that comes up off of it either. That's not, I didn't used to understand why people died from smoke inhalation, but I understand now. And so God has already released a word that covers the arrogant. And he said, every evildoer, because the Lord is precise with his words. That's why I found out about how God talks. He's pinpoint accurate, which is why you have to study the word of God with precision. So if God said, every evil do, every evildoer will be stubble, that means if that takes a thousand years from our point of view, it doesn't matter what all them evildoers and arrogant people did in that time, because God already said, here's your end. And then the Lord says, not a root or a branch will be left to them. Remember, I told you about how when you serve God, one of the things, one of the rewards 
of the Lord is a forever name. That means God is going to give you a name that lasts forever, just like his name. He has a name that's above every name. Jesus' name is above every name, but he doesn't have the only name. Just like he has the crown of crowns, but he doesn't have the only crown. Just like he has the throne of thrones, but he doesn't have the only throne. He gives us rewards like Father gave him. You see that? He has the highest. He's the King of kings and Lord of lords and the name above every name. But he gives us things like that too. That's why we know who Abraham is and Moses and Esther and Ruth and Sarah and Samson and David and Samuel. That's why we still know these people. Because when you serve the Lord, you get a forever name. And he said, this is what wicked, wicked people get. Not a root or a branch will be left to them. So God has already said that when it comes to evildoers and arrogant people, the days gonna come where we see it out here, where there's nothing left in them. I just want you to think about somebody that lived 90 years and never got saved and thought they was big balling and shot calling and then their whole life just burned up. Then we're gonna go to verse two, but for you who fear my name, you see the contrast? See how the Bible just switched from judgment to grace, but for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness, as you in of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings and you will go out and leap, there it is, like calves from the stall. For, but for you who fear my name, those that love the Lord, fear the Lord, fear the Lord, serve the Lord, the son of righteousness will rise. So in other words, God said, there's a furnace coming for the wicked, but the sun is gonna rise for us and it's gonna have healing. It's not gonna be burning us up. It's gonna be healing us. And you will go out and leap like calves from the stall. I stopped by to tell you that is not just talking about that great day when the world ends. That's talking about now. Do you know how I know that? Because I've already experienced it. I've been in the presence of the Lord at times where I felt him release some glory and I got healed. When you come into God's presence, his glory is tangible. It, you can feel it. And I've been in the presence of the Lord where it's, it's like he turned his light up. I don't know how to describe it. He turned his glory up and I felt the healing come in my soul, come in my body, come in my mind. I felt it. That's how I know. That's right now. That's not just for that day. That when you fear his name, he can just draw near to you and open up some of his glory on you and heal you. Now, this is what I'm trying to tell you. One more scripture and I'll, I'll be done. We're going to look at Luke chapter 1, verse 41. Now, as we know, Luke was a doctor and Luke wrote, third book in the New Testament, the account of Jesus' life. This particular section is about when Mary found out she was pregnant with Jesus from Gabriel. Her uh, cousin Elizabeth, I'm sorry, her sister Elizabeth, because Jesus and John the Baptist were cousins. Her sister Elizabeth was already six months pregnant with John the Baptist. Now, John the Baptist was another miracle baby because Elizabeth and Zachariah, her, her husband, were older. So just like Abraham and Sarah, they shouldn't have been able to conceive at all. And Elizabeth is six months pregnant with a miracle baby. That baby is John the Baptist, the one that God had called to make plain the way of the Lord on earth. So Mary just found out from Gabriel that she was the blessed mother of Christ that the baby she was going to carry, that the Spirit of God was going to put Jesus in her womb and that she was going to give birth to the Christ child. You have to understand that women had been waiting for generations, particularly Jewish women, for Messiah to come through their womb, for them to be that blessed mother, for them to hold that position. And Mary got chosen to have that position. She had just found out she went to her sister's house. So Luke chapter 1, verse uh, 40 and 41, where she married, entered the home of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. So the verses before that talk about her going to see them. Verse 41, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, right there. 
<clears throat> what happened when John the Baptist is, he's not even fully formed yet. He's in his mother's womb, but Mary heard the news. How did John the Baptist, <laughs> how did he know he wasn't even born yet? This is what I'm trying to tell you. When you deal with God, you have to step out of the natural realm because regular rules do not apply. <laughs> he was able to somehow sense while he was still forming, he's only six months inside his mother. While he was still forming inside of his mom. See, you got to form at least seven months to be formed enough to live outside your mom and you're still a preemie. And a lot of preemies have a lot of problems. This is six months. And when Mary told her sister Elizabeth that uh, she was pregnant with the Christ child and uh, she was gonna be the mother of the Messiah and <clears throat> he, she went and told Elizabeth that thing. And uh, sometimes the, the translations say that they were cousins, but a lot of other translations say that they were sisters. So, you, you know, so uh, it's just the same thing with a lot of scholars. I read a lot of different scholars and they, they seem to have different interpretations of things. So some people say Mary and Elizabeth were cousins. Some people say Mary and Elizabeth were sisters, but Jesus and John the Baptist were relatives. So anyway, when John the Baptist and his mama got a prophetic word, the baby responded by leaping. I want you to ask yourself one question, how? <laughs> it wasn't even a full baby yet. How? How? See, it, because it doesn't make any sense in the natural. But if the Bible says it happened, it happened. And so the baby leaped in the womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. Elizabeth got a witness that what Mary was saying was true. She got two witnesses. She got the filling of the spirit and she got the leaping out of baby. So I'm saying that to say that some of y'all looking at me are, are, are thinking that God's deliverance is out there somewhere someday. But this whole prophetic word has been about, no, it can be pulled into your life right now by faith. Because in this story that I just read you, read you we have an older woman with an older husband having a not fully formed baby leap in the womb, and then she got filled with the Holy Ghost. None about that makes any sense in the natural. You can't explain that by natural means from any angle. And yet it happened. Just like Mary having a conversation with Joseph saying that she was pregnant, but she didn't cheat. She was still a virgin. That had to be a conversation. So the point I'm trying to make is that for those of you that can catch this word, that can receive what's being said here, you can pull the miracle that you keep thinking is 40, 47 weeks away into your life right now. But it's going to take a leap. That's why the title of this prophetic word is leap year. It's going to take a leap. You're going to have to jump. You're going to have to jump. I found out that that is why a lot of people don't get the miracle that they want. Because it's going to require a leap of faith. And what a lot of people are looking for is a finished product. And what a lot of people are looking for is the right conditions. And what a lot of people are looking for is uh, the easy button. That was easy. Uh, that's what a lot of people are looking for. But when you actually study the scriptures, there wasn't nothing easy about Noah having to build an ark and everybody laughing at him. Can you imagine being Noah? Can you imagine? Can you imagine what it must have been like to build an ark and everybody you know think you are the craziest person they've ever seen? Can't That can't have been easy. Jesus died by faith. There's a scripture in the Psalms where King David says, for thou will not leave my soul in hell. Thou shalt not suffer thy holy one to see corruption. Okay, that was a prophetic word about how Jesus was trusting Father for when he descended into the hell realm. So in other words, Jesus was trusting Father not to let his body begin to get corrupt and decay like a body normally would three days later. And Jesus went down to hell to preach to all the people in the underworld to show them that he was the Messiah. Jesus was trusting Father as he died, saying, 
I know you're not going to leave me in hell. You're going to bring me back out. And I know you're not going to let my body decay. You're not going to let it get corrupt. That means Jesus died by faith. That means he allowed himself to go through all that because he was trusting Father to bring him back. Say that one more time. Jesus allowed himself to go through all that because he was trusting Father to bring him back. See what I mean? So I've discovered, I've discovered, I know people, I know people who got it right and I know people who got it wrong. This thing I'm about to say, then I'm gonna close marriage. There's one person I know met the right person, but that right person lived out of state. This particular person was white and they person was black. So out of state, you know, black person with another state over white person, and they would have had to take a leap to make that relationship work. Because what makes you think that when God brings you the one that it's going to be in this neat package, that it's not going to require sacrifice of faith, that I know another person who said, I have to move, I have to leave. And I was like, why? And they was like, because the Lord is telling me to move to this other state and my husband's out there. And I was like, are you sure? And they're like, yeah. So they moved, they left and sure enough, they met their husband and they are still together now. That's an example of somebody that got it because they took the leap and somebody that missed it because they didn't take the leap. That's what I'm trying to tell you. That's what I'm trying to tell you. So today's prophetic word is about a leap year. And what that means is that it's time for some of us to even if we got to pull the miracle out from behind you, he ain't even looking, the miracle ain't even looking at you. And you got to have enough faith to pull it out of the hem of his garment. You got to have enough faith to be an old woman with an old husband and have a baby name fully formed that know the Lord when he hear it. Because remember, Jesus wasn't formed yet either. Mary just found out she was pregnant. That means Jesus wasn't formed at all. <laughs> okay. If Elizabeth is six months along and Mary just found out from Gabriel and yet the baby leaped, okay? The man at the temple gate had never walked in his life and he went from never walking to jumping up, walking around, leaping and jumping and praising God. King David said, I'm running through armies of jokers. <laughs> I'm not doing that in the natural. You follow that? And Isaiah, again, is multi-time lamed, just like everything God says. It can be in your life now. All right? Amen and amen. I'm trying to see if the Holy Ghost is giving me anything else. Because I'm blown away by this word, and I'm encouraged by this word, and there's a lot that can be done. All right. So that's it. That's it for today's prophetic word. Thanks to those of you that watch me live. God bless you to those of you that are watching at the replay. Remember, every week I ask you to do one thing. And once again, I'm going to ask you to share this video in as many places as you can, because it's a leap year. See, I'm starting to really see that in the spirit. That's why you have to say stuff over and over and over again. I'm starting to see it as I'm saying it. That means there's some stuff available, but it's only for the leapers. Mm. So it's time to get out of our comfort zone and start leaping up to get our miracles, all right? I will see you next Sunday, same time. Uh, next Sunday, same time, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time for the next weekly live prophetic word. Don't forget to go back and look at No More Genies. Last one I did, I did Who Is God, part four. And uh, so praise God. Um, I'm happy to be out here on my post, happy to let God use me and excited about what the Lord is doing because now my mind is churning with all the ways I need to leave. Amen. God bless. And I'll see you next time.